before we get onto the controversial stuff, I think that we can agree about something not so controversial, and that is that sunscreen is critical. But the problem is that this is a product we're telling our patients to apply in a thick layer of a large body surface area and to reapply frequently. So we need to be absolutely certain about the safety data about sunscreen, both from a physiological perspective as well as from an environmental perspective. These are some of the questions I'd like to touch on today, and let's start with the environment. In July 2018, Hawaii became the first US state to ban oxybenzone and octanoxate, and they were followed shortly thereafter by Key West in Florida. At the same time, we've got retailers in the US that have pledged to remove an oxybenzone and octanoxate containing products from their stores, and there are other sunscreen manufacturers that are reformulating their sunscreens without these ingredients so that they can classify them as reef safe. But why? This man, Craig Downs. So in 2015, at the World Conservation Congress of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, he disclosed research showing that oxybenzone is implicated as a cause in coral larvae deformity, bleaching, and DNA damage and this weakens coral's adaptability to climate change. And this is a particular problem in Hawaii because of their high level of tourists, and their coral is being bleached at unprecedented rates. What Coral's research team did is they placed coral larvae and tiny wells and microplates with artificially created seawater with oxybenzone at environmentally re relevant levels and what they found is that the coral reacted by changing shape and turning white, indicative of bleaching. What happens is that when coral is stressed, they expel algae from their surface, now algae being their source of food, and they turn white, which is bleaching, and this means that they're more vulnerable to disease and death. So Craig Downs wasn't the first to show this phenomenon that would happen. The first was actually in 2008 in the Environmental Health Perspectives Journal by a group of Italian scientists who showed that this phenomenon was caused by the sunscreen promoting viral infections in the seawater. And there have been a number of studies since Craig Downs' study which have done the same thing with similar findings. So some important statistics. When you consider 25% of our sunscreen washes off our body within 20 minutes of going into the water, releasing 6,000 tons of sunscreen into our coral reefs each year globally. And if you consider that the coral reefs, which are the so-called rainforests of the sea, provide a home to 25% of all marine species and are a hugely valuable ecosystem, this is cause for concern. Another note of concern is that according to Craig Downs, oxybenzone can be found in the urine within 20 minutes of applying sunscreen, which has implications for contamination of our water supplies. The properties of the chemical filters means that our waste treatment processes can't easily remove them, which means that they then re-enter our waste system as evident, with the rest then contaminating the ocean. And what is important is that oxybenzone can be found at environmentally relevant concentrations. Arguably, the lowest concentration to cause coral toxicity is as low as 62 parts per trillion. So to put that into perspective, that is a single drop of water in six and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools. If we relate it back to this graphic and you look at Trump Bay in the Virgin Islands National Park, their level of oxybenzone is 1.4 parts per million, phenomenally higher than this arguably lowest concentration. And also of interest is that levels of oxybenzone have been found as far as in the Antarctic. So they are being dispersed by water currents very far from where they are initially being deposited. Let's look at the way that these UV blockers can affect the marine ecosystems. There are five mechanisms. So the first is that of endocrine disruption, and I spent quite a lot of time yesterday going into this in more detail. But oxybenzone leads to disruption in the spawning, 
fertilization, and development of new coral. And it's not only the coral, it also affects the early developmental stages of the sea urchin, both oxybenzone and homocellate. It causes decreased coral larval activity and it can lead to gross abnormalities in morphology when juvenile coral is exposed to oxybenzone. So what happens is that they can stop swimming, they change their shape, and they actually can increase their mouth size up to five times their normal size. They can cause DNA damage with its implications for reproduction. And another thing that can happen is this aspect of bioaccumulation. And this is when the levels in an organism become higher than the environment. So the levels of oxybenzone in the fish is actually higher than what you can find in the water. And then there's another concept of biomagnification. And this is when the concentration and how detrimental the chemical is also increases as you move up the food chain. Some may say it serves us right. And you can feel like Alice falling down the rabbit hole as you examine more and even more research showing good studies showing the impact on the marine systems. So I know that all of you are probably biting your tongue and saying, what about all the other bad things affecting the reefs? So there are two aspects. The first is that on the flip side, there are other studies that have shown that in other environmental exposure conditions that more closely reflect what's actually happening in the natal coral reefs, that oxybenzone was shown to actually not cause bleaching. That's issue number one. Issue number two is that undeniably global warming is the main cause of coral bleaching. Warmer oceans, rising water levels, acidification, overfishing, and pollution. But the important thing to remember is that chemical filters and sunscreens are an incremental stressor in a system that is already <coughs> stressed beyond its capacity. That being said, Mike Beacon, which is a, an oceanographer, he likened oxybenzone causing death to coral as death by a thousand cuts. Climate change, on the other hand, has been like a nuclear blast. Let's look at a little bit about the safety in humans. To understand how oxybenzone can impact us, we must look a little bit at their structure. And the importance in a lot of them is this benzophenone group. If you look at estradiol, you can see the similarity. And this is how they function as endocrine disrupting chemicals. So what they do is they bind to nuclear receptors acting as ligands and they can act as either agonists in the case of estradiol or antagonists in the case of androgens. So why is this important? UV filters with the highest toxicity concerns are oxybenzone with a hazard score of 8 out of 10 according to the environmental working group, octanoxate with a hazard score of 6 out of 10, Oxybenzone being found in the serum manure and in 85% of breast milk samples. They also impact fertility with significantly associations with pregnancy, birth outcomes, and they've also been implicated in Hirschman's disease. Thinking back to that they're antagonized androgens, you can see that it is important because in adolescent boys, it's inversely related to their testosterone levels, which is an, again why we get these claims of male infertility. Oxybenzone and octanoxate cause cellular proliferation of the MCF7 breast cancer cell line in vitro, and octanoxate has been linked to changing the thyroid axis. They have also been linked of these sunscreen filters with neurotoxicity. UV filters with moderate toxicity concerns include homocellate, octosalate, and octoquilin coming down to better levels. So here, a 3 out of 10 hazard score, which is in the green if you know the EWG rating. And now those with the lower toxicity concerns, including the physical filters, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, avobenzone, which is safe, but it has terrible stability issues, and then the newer chemical filters such as menstrual. 
It is also important when looking at sunscreens, don't forget about the inactive ingredients because these make up 50 to 70 percent of the sunscreens. So I spoke about things like parabens yesterday. Another ingredient to, to keep in mind is this one. Methyl isothiazolinone. It was given the dubious honor in 2013 of being called Allergen of the Year. So if you think about this being in our sunscreens and you're putting it over pretty large body surface areas multiple times, this is definitely a cause for concern. So what are our alternatives? Let's look at the physical filters. So no benzophenone groups here. And what's interesting is if you look at zinc oxide and how broad spectrum the protection is, it's actually the best out of all of them. So it's got good UVA and UVB cover, though arguably it's better in the longer UVA wavelengths, but the titanium dioxide is actually better at UVB and UVA too. So it's quite nice to find a product that combines the two to get the best broad spectrum um, protection. Avobenzone also gets you good longer UVA wavelength protection, but again, this has to be stabilized by other filters, so it's never used on its own. So the pitfall of um, these mineral filters is that of nanoparticles, and the biggest reason is that they can create reactive oxygen species as they break down. But if you look at human safety reviews, they are not a concern for human safety, because the free radicals are quenched by the body's own antioxidant mechanisms, and they remain localized to the epidermis and to the stratum corneum, they're not absorbed. But there is one exception, and that is in the case of inhalation of titanium dioxide. It damages the lungs, and it is a potential carcinogen when inhaled, so it must never be used in an aerosol, and there are ones out there using it. Another issue when it comes to titanium dioxide is the whole issue about having multiple points of exposure and environmental release. So this has implications in the workplace when it comes to formulation and packaging. 50,000 tons of nano and titanium dioxide is produced in 2010, and yet, as of yet, no assessment of worker risks or environmental outcomes have yet to be assessed. So where are we in terms of regulations? There's absolutely no international standard, and it took me a long time to get to grips with all the different regulations in the different countries. So for example, there are different classifications. Some countries classify them as drugs, some countries classify them as cosmetics. In Australia, they're therapeutic goods. In different countries, there are actually different UV filters that are allowed. So in the US, for example, they do not allow mixed roll or tinosaur um, because of the Sunscreen Innovation Act in 2014, saying that there was insufficient safety data. So they're very limited there. In each country, there are different concentrations of filters allowed. They have different methods of calculating SPF and different methods of calculating UVA protection. I think that we're all very clued up when it comes to how we get to our SVFs. So basically, you're calculating your MED of protected and unprotected skin in 10 to 25 volunteers. We use the two milligrams per square centimeter amount of sunscreen, irradiate, and then we assess the erythema 16 to 24 hours later and you get your SVF. UVA testing is a whole other ball game and a lot more complicated because there are so many different methods that people are using. So for example, in the US, they always have to be different. They're using this broad spectrum classification and I'll provide a little more clarity on that a bit later. The EU uses a critical wavelength and the UVA protection factor, which is used to be used with the Kalipa, which then became the revised Kalipa, and which is now the ISO, International Organization of Standardization, 2443 regulations. <coughs> In Japan, they're still using persistent pigment darkening. And the, the criteria in terms of how we measure UVA and why Kalipa changed its method of calculating the UVA protection is the whole issue of degradation. Chemical filters degrade, with the exception actually of tinosol. There's no photo degradation when it comes to physical filters. If you look at major degradation, that's more than 50% degradation when exposed to 10 MEDs, you'll see other benzone 
and falling into that category, while 25% degradation happens with homo salate and octinoxate. So this ISO 2443 method, which is the revised Kalipa method, added in an extra step, used to just basically scan the product, get your UVA reading. Now what you've got to do is you've got to scan the product, you have to irradiate the product, and then you can scan again, and that will give you a reading. And the final UVA has to be one third of the SPF. As I said, US does not follow this rule, as was highlighted in this review on sunscreen regulation by Joshua Sharfstein. They go by the broad spectrum definition. In 2011, the FDA set weak UVA protection rules, which enabled nearly every product to achieve a passing grade, allowing products to advertise broad spectrum protection. So what is the problem here? The problem as shown by Brian Dippy is he examined what the consequences are of using a poor quality sunscreen. And he found that over a two week holiday using a US sunscreen, a fair skin tourist could prevent sunburn but receive the equivalent UVA as visiting a sunbed 10 times for eight minute sessions. He also found that the UV sunscreens allowed three times as much UVA through as compared to the EU sunscreens. Where are we in South Africa? In 2012, our South African sunscreens came under fire because of this article that was published in the Nose Week. And what happened was that Cancer asked Future Cosmetics which is an independent laboratory in South Africa, to test 10% sample of our 357 local sunscreens. And what they found that although all sunscreens complied with the existing regulation at the time, which was actually the Boots method, the, the STARS, that all samples came up well short of the EU <laughs> standard, with some products degrading completely and all products degrading to some degree. And the important thing to note, that still today, there is no local law enforcing compliance to any standard. So basically, we are completely self-regulatory, which has huge issues of its own. <coughs> Cancer stepped up to the plate and they basically set a 2013 deadline for manufacturers to reformulate using the new ISO 2443 standards or they would lose their cancer <coughs> endorsement. So manufacturers have to do this, and it's not a cheap exercise. It costs 40,000 rand each time you test a product. But the products that pass this test were given the cancer Sun Smart Choice seal. So if you see this seal, you know that there are the EU standards of testing UVA. <coughs> the next thing that came to light when looking at South African sunscreens is, okay, now they're measuring UVA correctly, but are the ingredients actually safe? In accordance with the EU, our oxybenzone concentration has to be limited to 6%, octanoxate and octacrylene has to be limited to 10%. So the Sunday Times published this article in December last year, and they did a snap survey of eight of the top selling sunscreens. As you can see, they all contain oxybenzone, octanoxate, octacrylene. But only two brands had caution labels. Not a single brand listed the percentage of the ingredients that they were using. And despite the fact that in Diskim's case, they claimed to be oxybenzone free since 2016. In 2018, at the time of the survey, oxybenzone and, in fact, octanoxate. So apparently they just had old stock on the shelves two years later. Another company said that the percentage of ingredients were not disclosed in the packaging because it was proprietary and confidential. So cancer, it was to cancer again, to then say, stop using oxybenzone by last year December or lose your endorsement. And that's where we're sitting at the moment. But to this day, still, there's been no enforcement to remove old stock from the shelves. <coughs> So in the US, there has been this fire that has been started with regards to the FDA and sunscreens. And this is the study which lit the fuse. Up until now, the FDA relied on manufacturers to provide the data and sunscreen active ingredients to establish safety. But the growing concern is that we are using 
more active ingredients at higher concentrations in our new formulations. And we have no idea what the absorption or what the systemic effects of that absorption are. So in, in what the FDA did is they formed an independent non-prescription drugs advisory committee and they have demanded a must or maximal usage trial data to be done. So they took 24 participants, four sunscreens. They applied these sunscreens at two milligrams per square centimeter, over 75% of their body surface area, four times a day for four days. And then researchers took blood samples, 30 blood samples over seven days from each subject. And what they found is that when it comes to the threshold of toxicological concern, that level is 0.5 nanograms per mole. In this study, this level was reached within six hours of applying avobenzone and octocrylene, and within two hours of applying oxybenzone. What was more concerning is that the concentration continued to increase over time, with the maximum concentration of oxybenzone that was reached going right up to almost 210 nanograms per mole at 57 hours. So what does this all mean? Because we know that absorption is not necessarily a problem. It's the systemic effects that it's actually causing that can be problematic. So if you look at coffee, for example, caffeine blood levels are 50 times higher than the oxybenzone peak concentration. Whereas if you look at smoking a cigarette, oxybenzone level is seven times higher than the blood nicotine levels after smoking. And we know that nicotine can reach the brain within 10 to 20 seconds. The bottom line is that we don't know. We don't know the risk. But before we are telling people to put these products on the huge body surface areas, we need to find out. So the FDA has proposed an amendment to the sunscreen monograph, which they want to pass later this year in November. And the final monograph on sunscreens says that these products are unsafe. Titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are generally regarded as safe and affected for grass. Twelve chemical filters here are inconclusive. And now what the U.S. has said is that they need safety data on these 12 chemical filters by November or they're pulling products containing these ingredients off the shelves. So if you think back to that Sunscreen Innovation Act in 2014, looking at things like Tinosol and Mexrol, and they're sitting five years later still without that safety data, you can see that this is an absolutely impossible request by them. So this leaves the U.S. in a bit of a pickle. So they've got two thirds of sunscreens with either inadequate UVA protection or containing the 12 ingredients that are no longer considered to be grass. They don't have the newer European filters and the new testing could take up to five years. So US consumers have been left a little bit in limbo. This has escalated the need to look for alternatives in sunscreens. So what are we looking for? We're looking for something that is truly broad spectrum, not US broad spectrum, with a good antioxidant capacity to quench the oxygen-free radicals that happens on exposure to UV. We're going to have good skin compatibility and good emollients for cosmetic acceptability. They also have to be non-toxic to humans, non-toxic to aquatic life, and ideally biodegradable. So a quick note on antioxidants, because this came up quite a lot yesterday, specifically looking at the synergistic actions of vitamin C and vitamin E. And antioxidants, as has already been said, is such a beautiful thing to have in a sunscreen because of all these oxygen-free radicals that are being um, given off. But a note is that although antioxidants quench free radicals and they also can stabilize filters such as avobenzone, they can also be broken down by the UV into harmful byproducts. And there was this study about retinal palmitate which showed that they sped up the development of tumors in hairless mice when exposed to UV. So although there have been other studies showing that vitamin A is safe in sunscreens, personally I don't think vitamin A becomes anything in products in the daytime. So what are alternatives? There are a lot of alternatives with good studies coming through, and I just wanted to make a note of this one, palm oil. 
It has excellent broad spectrum capacity and it is also a very potent antioxidant. So this will be a very good candidate for a future UV filter. <coughs> so what am I telling my patients? As a general rule, I tell them, you have to apply your sunscreen, it's critical. But, read your ingredients, empire yourself, know the chemical filters, and it is so confusing because each filter is known by a number of different names. So if it's confusing for us, there's no way that they will understand that. But we have resources. So I send them to the EWG Skin Deep database. There's this build your own report. If our products are not there, you can plug in the ingredients and it will give you a whole reading of what is in the product and their toxicity and safety data concerns. I really encourage my patients to choose a physical filter. I know that it takes longer to rub in, but there are ones that are available that do not leave that ashy um, residue on darker skins. It just takes more time. And if I could convert my husband, who went from not wanting to use any sunscreen at all, to finally using an aerosol, then a chemical filter, who is now using a physical filter with no complaints at all, you can convert anyone into using a physical filter. <laughs> I also really drop in the fact that you want to look at your sun protective behavior and I really emphasize the use of sun protective clothing. My conflicts of interest are the laboratory and compounding pharmacy that I'm currently building at the practice where we'll be creating our own products called Root 4 and also a range of UPF protected rash basin and caftans that we'll be launching earlier next year. But more than that, I really don't miss an opportunity to show off my children. My conflict of interest is my beautiful family. I care about what I put on their skin and I care about what is going into the ocean that is their playground and that is a valuable ecosystem which is supporting us all. Thank you.